New week of the call up, and we hope you had a wonderful weekend. We are winding down the minor league season here, so we've got several more promotions to talk about, some performers, and we're going to get you primed up for the playoffs. Some notable pitching performers, or at least some notable pitchers who will be going in the playoffs here as we have double A creeping up, and then also you've got the low A championships going on as well, which I'm excited to get a live look at tomorrow. Uh, And that could be a clincher for Lakeland. I hope not, because then we could get an extra game here uh, with with I think with what J.J. Weatherholt's doing right now, I don't think he wants the season to end, unlike uh, a Derek, Derek Bender. Bender. Yeah, Derek I was going to say, I think yeah. he really would want the season to continue going. So a third game in the series would be awesome. And we're going to talk a little bit about J.J. Weatherholt as well. A couple big league debuts to get into, maybe not the most exciting in the world, but uh, I, I think definitely players that we've talked about throughout this year. And I think the great part about the promotion side of things is – it gives us the opportunity to talk about players that maybe we, we haven't. And sometimes it's because, uh, okay, he's now doing well. Let's talk about what's do- going well and, and how his role fits at the big league level or why he may have been promoted or this guy's struggling, but he was promoted. Let's talk about why. And I think that kind of leads us right into Luis Angel Acuna, who I think really fits the bill of this guy's been struggling. Uh, he's already on the 40, so they needed a guy up there with yeah. Francisco Lindor going down. But, man – um, you almost wondered if they would be better off, you know, just going outside, seeing if they could just sign a vet if there's anyone out there. But odds are probably not. They're not going to be going uh, full fledged like in the rhythm of things like the way Acuna is. But with how bad it's been for Luis Angel Acuna offensively this year, I think this also does really solidify how valuable he is defensively and yeah. with his legs. And I think what the Mets think of his makeup to the fact that they don't expect him to get up there and do much offensively. It's been a bad year for him as a younger guy in triple a, but they don't care. They need bodies up there. They need a guy that can go pick it. And that's exactly what he's up there to do and hold it down until this Francisco Lindor MRI comes back, which hopefully will come back clean. Uh, Well, good afternoon, Arm. How are you? How was your weekend? Good. Yep. I yeah. like to get into it, maybe when we're on the call up. <laughs> yeah, um, I realized uh, I didn't even, I didn't even, yeah, ask you how you're doing. How was the wedding? Yeah, all good. It, it was fine. Yeah, this Sunday was a tough day, um, but you know what? We recoup and and we get after it. Uh, Luis San Helicunia started two for seven, which is two eighty six, um, which is about thirty points better than he was hitting in AAA. Uh, Acuna to attach some numbers to that. 131 games in Syracuse is age 22 season. He's four and a half years younger, but granted like triple A is so weird. And I was having this conversation with somebody else like last week, literally. Um, I, I think, yeah, you, the COVID wrinkle, but also just contraction in general has skewed triple A to a point where you are going to get so many 21, 22 year old prospects that are up there with the 35 year olds. And these are going to skew the league average hitter age in a different direction. I think low A and high A that matters. I think in double and triple A, like you see, Oh, compared to league average, I don't think that age matters too much because we're in a weird spot in minor league baseball. And I don't know what the correction is. You know, maybe you've got 21 year olds that are going to coexist with 35 year olds moving forward. And and that's, you know, cool with me, but at the end of the day, it feels like guys are getting to triple A and double A very, very quickly. Um, and some of it is not because of performance. Some of it is because there are not many minor league affiliates to put a bunch of players at, and you have strong limits on the roster size and yada, yada, yada. But 131 games in his age 22 season in AAA, this guy, this guy slashed 258, 299, 355. So that's a 654 OPS, seven homers in 587 plate appearances. Now he swiped 40 bags. He kept the K's in check, but there was, there was minimal impact, it seemed. But I'm with you. Like, this says more about his abilities defensively than I think anything. Yeah, and just the fact that, you know, I don't think he's going to fully be a disaster at the plate. Yes, a 69 WRC plus is quite disappointing. The slash line's been you know, pretty rough. But it's not like he's going to get his doors blown off and strike out 50% of the time. It's a 16% yeah. K rate in AAA. He's going to put the ball in play. He's going to run. And he's going to put some pressure on the defense. And you know, I think when you're in an emergency situation here, uh, where they just need someone to get up there and, and plug in. Uh, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to go get him. And, and we've talked about it. Like I thought one of the most underrated things, and when we talked about Luis Angel Acuna and why he was top 100 prospect for us going into the year, and I, I still think he can get right next year. I think that, real quick, to before I get into that point I was starting off on here, 
I think the age to level thing in AAA has to be a case by case thing, and you just got to look at the player in a vacuum. Um, yeah. But you know, I think the year difference thing where you see on Baseball Reference, yeah. Yeah, I agree, it's kind of wonky with AAA. But when you you could just zoom out, look at a 22 year old, you know, and he's 22 for I'm pretty sure the entirety of the season. He was 21, I think, right right, right at the time of spring training. Still, like, yeah. obviously, he's going to be a lot more raw than the other players at the triple a level so uh, i think that was just a clear thing here and and when you look at what he was doing last year he was really good in the texas league he gets traded over in that scherzer deal and i honestly thought he should have with the way he struggled in the 37 games in double a with the mets should have started this year in double a and then you know it's it's all hindsight's you know 2020 and all that good stuff but i I thought starting the year in triple a was was a little aggressive and it just seems like it's been a, a battle for him throughout the year. The contact rates are good. He's swiping bags with the best of them, and he's playing good defense. And I think the the point that I was going to get into is a lot of people were very quick to say, oh, Acuna is probably going to need to play center field or whatever. That yeah. was under the assumption that he was going to maybe hit his way through AAA and, and, and force the Mets' hand at the big league level. It wasn't because he's incapable of playing defense. He's actually a really good defender, I think, up the middle. Uh, but – you clearly have Lindor for a long time. So it was, okay, where do we get this guy other looks and things like that? So that's why you started to see the center field action. But it had nothing to do with whether he's capable of playing shortstop. He is a very solid shortstop. And all the video that I've delved into there, I was I was very impressed with. And I think the fact that the Mets were willing to you know bring this guy up and, and put him right there at short says how, how confident they are in his ability at shortstop. And he played 70 games there this year. Um, 31 in center and then 20 at second base. But that was also just to to get him experience in other spots, knowing that if all goes right, unless it's a catastrophic disaster, he's going to be up at the big league level before Lindor's contract's up. That's for sure. So right. I think that was the whole side of it. But he'd been swinging it a little bit better of late. And I, it's just I hate those like unceremonious call ups where it's you're excited for the guy. You want to see him do well. He picks up two knocks in, in a ball game, but it just doesn't feel the same because it's a little bit of this like fail upwards feeling, uh, but it's a good taste for him. He, they're trying to hang in the race here and, and, and yeah. grab that last wild card spot. And they look at him as an option, at least to be the nine hitter and, and fill in and, and at least be a bench role, just fill a role for them right now. Right. Take some of the pressure off of Glacius. But I mean, next year he should be back in triple a and he yeah. should probably be working on uh, getting the ball in the air more consistently, making better swing decisions, which have been two of the big issues for him. Uh, and, and I just think overall, being more comfortable with the hitter he wants to be. He's tapped into more power in the double A ranks at points, but now he's kind of gotten away from that again, just figuring out how he can be more productive. Uh, I think obviously get this opportunity, but this is going to be a big off season for him to build on that. And then go into age 23 season and prove that he's a different hitter at the triple A level. 130 games is a lot of games to not really make a huge shift one way or another here right. for a guy that's top 100 prospect. Yeah, man. And and the thing that I remember we talked about in, in February and in March was, hey, his swing, his setup is identical to Big Brother. His swing is pretty darn similar to Big Brother. The big difference there is Ronald can get away with liners and ground balls because he hits the ball 120 miles an hour. Luis Angel does not do that. So there needs to be a correction to lift the ball more, like you're saying. The, the last thing on Acuna do you think that the perception that the Mets have of him has changed this year, given the underperformance uh, of his Triple A season? You know, of that sixty-nine WRC plus in twenty twenty-four, where I think they viewed him as, "Hey, let's see you in center. Hey, let's see you at second, and maybe you turn into trade bait." Versus now, it's like, "Hey, let's see you in a bunch of different spots. You're going to fill in when Lindor gets hurt, but you may be our our bench utility type guy moving forward." I. I I just wonder if the Mets close their eyes and see a different role for Luis on Helicuna that may still be on the Mets because yeah. the trade value after this year is minimal at this point. No, I think it's it's a great question. One that ultimately I would love to be a fly in the wall and 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 know what the Mets were thinking there I, I, or what they're saying at this point. I, I think it would be extreme to fully you know change your perspective since he's twenty two, but I also think it would. Uh, I, it would be silly to pretend that there's not some frustration here and maybe some some question of, okay, what is this all going to look like? He's five foot eight, right? And I think one of the big things that I was excited about was he did make some adjustments to start to hit the ball in the air more consistently. And then he gets into another environment in double A and then also now gets a triple A and it seems like all of that goes backwards again. So 
I do think now where before I saw the defense, I saw the speed, I saw the trajectory of where the bat was going. I'm like, okay, now I can start to dream on a lot more doubles. He was chasing less and all these things. And then that all kind of takes a step backwards this year. I understand it's triple a, but still um, that does create some concern because it, it also doesn't help the idea that, Oh, he's on this upward trajectory and maximizing the offensive side of things where he might end up just being capped at, you know, a limited production guy, a lot of contact, and, you know, a lot of contact on the ground. And then it's going to be a lot about the speed, the defense, and, and everything else. So I, I do think that the, the Mets, at least going into next year now for sure, because if, if you ask them two years ago, they're probably looking, or even, I, I guess, last year, before the trade, or right when the trade goes down, let's say, and they assign him to Binghamton. At that point, they're probably thinking, okay, this guy could be up and be a part of our, our you know, whatever we got going on here, whether it's in second or center, or wherever, playing all around. He could be up and, and, and playing pretty regularly for us by the end of 2024. Right. Uh, and then I think with the way that this has gone this year, I'm sure they're still hoping that that guy's in there, but there's no way a Mets team that either is going to make the playoffs or is going to be just short of it is going to go into 2025 saying Luis Angel Acuna has a spot on this active roster based on how he performs. So I would say from that lens alone, um, the, the perception has to have altered a little bit. Uh, and, yeah. and I think it's going to be a really big off season for him. He does have bat speed. It's not going to be like his brother. And even when his brother is a little bit off, you see him start to put the ball on the ground a little bit more than he should. That's because of the mechanics and the path, but he's such a freakazoid that he can get it right and lift. It's a yeah. hard swing to be able to consistently lift with. So I, I, I'm, I'm curious to see how he goes out and, and maybe tries to make some adjustments this off season. Yeah. Um, let's go to a Red Sox here. Richard Fitz has gotten up, has made two big league starts at this point. We haven't talked about Fitz just yet. Richard Fitz was one of those under-the-radar promotions, I think, where, hey, all of a sudden, Richard Fitz is the probable starter for the Boston Red Sox today. And, and it went, not unreported, but it was, you know, it kind of fell um, to the bottom of a news cycle that was kind of crazy at the big league level. But Richard Fitz this year was eating innings, man. Last year, he was eating innings. He had 152 innings with double a Somerset in 2023 that that's like I forgot about how ludicrous that was and then in 24 this guy at 116 and two-thirds has a 417 ERA he K'd 111 and walked just 37 in those 117 he gets up he's worked 10 and two-thirds just two unearned runs against him he's not K in the world he's not walking the world he's limiting hard contact He's made a good first impression in the big leagues, it seems. And I watched the condensed game of his debut, and then I watched the condensed game of his second start, too. So I didn't really get the full at-bat rundown, but it, it felt like nobody was squaring anything up against no. him, which which was impressive and a little unexpected for me. But that's kind of who he's been, where he's just a, you know, get soft contact and a mass, a mass, a mass innings in a given start. Yeah, and he's, the last, like, handful of starts been getting the balls you know, in the air a little bit more. So I think he's been trusting that fastball and elevating it more. It's not like he throws slow. <laughs> it, it, he screams back into the rotation kind of pitch ability innings eater guy. And, and I think he can be a five and do that. And I think he's going to be valuable to the Red Sox next year, just because they're going to need innings and, and everybody needs innings nowadays. Uh, but the fact that he's throwing, you know, he's sitting 95 for the most part, it's, it's 94, 96 and he gets, decent amount of ride on the fastball i think seeing him lean into that more uh over these last few starts i think has been an interesting development and, and part of why i think the red Sox felt like they could bring him up to the big league level because when you look at the delivery it's kind of this lean back slight lean back and then it's very over the top yeah. and you know that that can be easier for hitters to pick up at times but also can make it very easy to spin the ball and and backspin it and get that ride uh he, he's also a guy that he was able to, to throw a cutter and a slider. And I think from that release point, when you establish the fastball at the top, can play well. Being a fly ball guy in, in Fenway, you know, that, that can be a challenge. And I'm interested to see how that all goes. Uh, but I, I think he's leaned into a little bit of a different type, which I think before it was kind of trying to kitchen sink, mixing in the splitter, mixing in a little bit of everything, trying to, to go up, down, east, west. I think now he's really leaning into, let me establish that heater at the top. It's not elite, but it's good enough. And from that release, it can play up. He's had a lot more confidence in that. And then I think everything else is kind of playing well off of that. You're not going to see as many strikeouts because he doesn't have that put away pitch yeah. really outside of the slider, uh, really the, the cutter. They kind of blend together too. And I think that's why he doesn't really have like 
as much swing and miss as you'd like to see. Like it's a cutter at 88 and then it's a slider at 86. And so yeah, even if a guy's sitting on one or the other, they might be able to still kind of spoil that. But yeah. with that same notion, they're also struggling to barrel it. So it seems like he's a guy that doesn't have as much of the VLO separation, doesn't have as much going on in general uh, in terms of being able to garner whiffs, but it is just enough to, I think, get the weak contact. And it is going to be really important um, to, to sequence well. And I think that's why it's, it's great that he's, he's in the Red Sox organization now and working at the big league level with their brass there. But just the last thing on, on the arsenal, right? yeah. fastball average is 94.8. His slowest pitch is you know that slider at 84. There's just not a ton of velo separation there, um, and 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 that's I think probably part of the reason why you don't see as many of the Ks. But I think this guy can make it work, and I think he can be yeah. a solid five for the Red Sox and, and eat a ton of innings. And I mean to to go to New York, where you were just traded from, right, and make your second big league start, your first on the road, and go five innings, a two hit ball, scoreless, three walks, but two Ks, and 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 again just limited the runs. I mean that 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 was impressive on multiple fronts. Yeah. And, you know, there are some guys that have minimal velocity separation that have carved out really long careers of just inducing soft contact. And I mean, like, I think this guy's the gold standard, but, you know, Lance Lynn was in the Cy Young conversation twice in, in his major league career. I, I'm not saying that he's going to be that. And Lynn also had years where he was Kang, you know, I think 10 and a half, 11 per nine. I don't have it pulled up, but I, I feel like I remember he was a bit more of a strikeout artist than you would typically expect. But this guy has gotten to 10 years of major league service time by inducing soft contact and by, you know, throwing a bunch of different things that move slightly different, but are all in the same, you know, speed bracket there. Mm -hmm. And and that is, you know, Rick Fitz could technically be, you know, poor man's Lance Lynn. My, my last Fitz question is another role thing like Acuna, but um, Quinn Priester is throwing the shit out of it right now. I would assume that the Red Sox are going to be somewhat active on the free agent pitching market because I you feel think. like they need some warm bodies. You would think they might not do it. Could there be any value to him being in a major league bullpen? I think so much of his value is he makes a start every fifth day. Yeah. Part of me thinks that they would rather do the elder thing where Bryce Elder is kind of shuttling between Gwinnett and Atlanta ready to give you seven innings if he's right, ready to give you five if he's not. I think I like I close my eyes and see that being Richard yeah. Fitz's role. I, I agree. Like I think most likely that makes the most sense. I at least though, if you did want to put him in the bullpen, you can rest on the laurels that that fastball would probably take up to 96, 97, right. and then he'd have that slider. I still don't think it's it's the type of of arsenal uh and the sliders good but it's not i don't think it's the type of pitch that you, you really want to see playing out of the bullpen but at least you could justify it more than like a bryce elder but i do agree like i think it makes a lot more sense to have him at the very least be that shuttle guy back and forth and i'm looking at like a cooper criswell right like it's been really nice to see criswell throw to a 398 this year but, but is it sustainable i'm with you yeah if it's not like you got fits right there waiting to go um and and you know i think that's that's a an interesting wrinkle in this thing cutter crawford even like he's flashed some great things but you know, he's got a four two and you know we'll see we'll see how he looks next year as well can he follow up what he's done uh but you know I think the Red Sox will have no issue trying to stockpile as many arms as they can and um I, I think there's going to be some pretty consistent opportunity for both the, of these guys in Quinn Priester and Richard Fitz to, to get some innings next year so I, I'm, I'm very fascinated to see how they go about it I would love to love to see a little bit more quality at the top yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know I, I think there, there's no harm in in the depth there overall and I wouldn't be shocked if they have him kind of in this like back and forth, like long relief spot to start type of role as well. Yeah. Uh, because we, we were talking about how the Red Sox could end up going with, you know, unique approaches and uh, to next year, especially with Luis Guerrero, who looked really solid in terms of the stuff in his, you know, first couple big league appearances, a Luis Guerrero opener with a Richard Fitz on the back of that Long would be yeah. would be pretty awesome. So he just kind of unlocks some opportunities for them to do some different things. And I think he could thrive in a bunch of different roles. I kind of see him as that Swiss Army knife as well. And if you have different types of Swiss Army knives, like that's really cool, which I think yeah. almost defeats the purpose of a Swiss Army knife because it does everything. But you know what I mean? 
Right. No, you, each guy is like a different piece of the Swiss Army knife. The Red Sox pitching staff is just one big Swiss Army knife, and Richard Fitz is the scissors, and then Priester is like the the smaller one blade thing. I I hear you on that. They because yeah, kind of- Guerrero is going to be like hard and and just shorter, like lower release, and then you're going to get this over the top guy. Like you can piece together some really uncomfortable bullpen games for teams. Yeah. So. Should be and fun. tell you, tell you, I think that's how Detroit has stayed in the mix here because they're yeah. opening with like a Bo Brisky, and then they're going with Brant Herter as the long man or Ty Madden as the long man. Like the, you can get creative, and and it's okay to be creative. And I think the Boston has interest in, in being creative based on their their personnel and their hires. Uh, much sexier name. We go from Richard Fitz to Bryce Eldridge, hmm. who just got up to Double A, and then just got up to Triple A. Bryce Eldridge, I'm just going to give you the game log rundown. 51 games with low A San Jose, had an 801 OPS. He gets the bump up to high A Eugene. 48 games with Eugene, hit 335 with a 1060 OPS. Then he gets to double A Richmond. Nine games, has 10 hits, including two doubles, a triple, and a homer. 785 OPS, eight Ks, and 40 plate appearances. So then the double A season ends. And he gets the bump up to AAA Sacramento this weekend. And Eldridge went two for nine, came three times. He's going to play one more week with Sacramento. And this guy in his age 19 season, and like quick aside, I'm just looking at the headshot and I see 6'7", 223. Very few 19-year-olds look like this, both physically and in the it's face. Crazy. Nobody really looks like Bryce Eldridge. But this guy in his age 19 season, he turns 20 on October 20th, is going to have a week and a half of AAA baseball under his belt. And I cannot believe that. I was going to say, you think they uh, you think they want him up there to start the year next year? Yeah, it's Wade Meckler style, is it not? This is a better Wade Meckler. They want this guy up there to help them next year. I think that's become abundantly clear. And I get it because he's given them a little bit of a window here. And, you know, when your first round pick, who you told to to bang the pitching thing because he's so good hitting and since doing that is absolutely mashed. And then this last 40 games, sitting 347 with an 1109 OPS uh, and, and obviously looks the part as well. I, I totally understand why you would want that guy in the fold and, and potentially – Uh, there to help your team next year. I I think it's very ambitious and I think it's very aggressive considering there's still some underlying with things that aren't bad, but from the perspective of rushing this type of player to the big leagues, like I think you could see some challenges against secondaries start to really rear their head uh, at at the big league level. I think, I think you could even see a little bit of it in triple a, but that's fine. Right? Like I think clearly double a was not much of a different challenge for him. So in, in, a, in a unique way, yes, the PCL is, is very, very, very hitter friendly, but you know, it, it, we don't really care about that, right? Like it doesn't really matter how many of Bryce Eldridge's fly balls leave the yard. No. It matters how often he's making contact with secondaries and stuff. And I know like in Reno and some of those other environments, the ball might not move as much, but still these guys are going to place it better. They're going to locate it better. They're going to know how to attack a Bryce Eldridge better. So I think it's actually incredibly beneficial to have him up there and, um, just get used to it, especially as a six, seven lefty. Guess what you're going to see a lot of from righties change, 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 fastball up, change. And like, how, how do you adjust to those change ups? How do you adjust to pitchers going so much more North South against you? Like, I think these are all great things for him to hone in on uh, at the triple a level. So um, I, it's, it's, it's remarkable. You generally don't see it with right. a 19 year old, but I don't think it's crazy or anything like that. It was just surprising because you don't see it. But I, I love it. I, I want to see these guys get up as soon as possible. And it seems like yeah, he'll probably start the year in AAA next year, I'd assume. But I don't you know, know, dude. They're you weird. Never know. He, with a good with a good spring training, he could have a chance to break camp and you know, he fits all the the, the PPI uh you know, th- thresholds, I guess, right? Being on every top one hundred list, like he'll he'll be a guy that could get them a pick if it works. Uh, but you know, at the very least, it this has expedited his timeline exponentially because even if he doesn't break camp, he's a candidate to be one of the first guys promoted early next year, uh, right. which is awesome and fun. And, and it's not like he's, you know, 18 and we're talking about this, this wonder kid. Obviously he is a wonder kid, but we're not talking about a, a kid that is going to get blown up because he's a, he's a baby. He's going to be 20 years old at, you know, opening day of next year. He turns 20 in late October again. Um, I, 
it's weird because he's climbed four levels in the span of a given season, but I'm with you. I entirely see the reasoning behind him getting to AAA at this point. Um, he has first round credentials versus like a Wade Meckler last year. Yeah. I'm yeah. just like, really? And just like a self-imposed 40 crunch by doing that too. Yeah. It was just bizarre, but this one I, I kind of get, and I'm curious what they're going to do. Hey, Lamont Wade is one of the very few guys with some control that has, you know, some trade value here. Um, I, I want to know how they operate this off season because I'm starting to really doubt the capabilities of that front office because yeah. we have stagnated. They have stagnated for a while now. Um, I want to see what kind of ripple this has in the San Francisco Giants offseason because I feel like it's going to be noticeable because all of a sudden you have this kid Eldridge that is ready to go. Yeah, and I, I do wonder, though, the one thing is – I'd love to see this guy in the lineup every day. Uh, yeah. This is a, a guy that can hit 40 homers. You want him in the lineup every day. He has not really turned the corner yet against lefties, which is totally normal. He's a 6'7", 19-year-old. Right. 591 OPS against lefties, and you're going to fast track him to the show. I'd imagine with the way that the Giants like to operate, he's probably going to mostly face righties. So then how does he develop his ability to, to hit lefties? When is that going to come? Um that's the interesting wrinkle in this thing. Maybe they just throw him out there and let him do it. And, do, and that's that's fine too. Now, counter, do you think there's a world where they have him up there and they don't let him do it? And all of a sudden, I think it's very years, possible. which sucks. And it it is not great for his development as a hitter if you get up there and you're shielded. And I think we saw a perfect example of that in St. Louis with Nolan Gorman, where he was up there, he was not seeing a lefty to save his life. And all of a sudden, we're, we're two and a half years into Nolan Gorman's career. And it's like, wow, this guy hasn't even gotten the opportunity to turn into an everyday player. That's my one concern. Um, because they do have a fair amount of guys that that do hit the short side of the platoon pretty well. And that's, that's just going to be the interesting aspect to this whole thing, see how they go about that. But maybe they'll just let him go. And, and I think they yeah. should. If, if they're going to operate that way, you just got to take the good with the bad and uh, you can always pinch it for him, you know, in the sixth or seventh, if, you know, a lefty reliever comes in or whatever, but you got to give him the opportunity here to, to develop because you want that guy to hit his ceiling, which is to be in the lineup every day. And he, he very much has the ability, I think, to get better and more comfortable against lefties. But you think about the financial aspect of things, they want to go spend, they want to go maybe sign another big fish when you can have a masher potentially on the minimum and just allocate those funds to adding another star. Uh, yeah. it, it makes a lot of sense there too. So I can't wait to see how spring training goes, but this is already now with the way that they have approached this. He's already circled for me as one of the players that I'm going to be zoned in on a little bit more come spring training time as to whether they could actually you know, go out there and, and win a job. And it's been a lot of games for him this year, so I don't know if they would send him out there, but maybe – the AFL if they want to keep building on things. But I think this was probably instead of the AFL, hey, go play a few more games in AAA um, and finish the year with with a few more extra games. Because AFL is a shorter season than people think. So right. you get a couple extra weeks in or even another 10 games in AAA, it's not all that different. I, I would think this is probably in substitute of the Arizona yeah. Fall League. I will also say in terms of next spring, him and Job are the clear cut one and two on my list of guys that I'm watching in spring training. And then after that, I, I think it falls off pretty quickly. Um, yeah. I'd be fascinated by DeLauder in Cleveland as well, but I, that guy is not given Emmanuel the Rodriguez will be interesting to watch Emmanuel Rodriguez for sure. But like, I, I don't know for, for how young and how many levels he's climbed this year. Eldridge is right up there with the top pitching prospect in baseball for me in terms of intrigue mm -hmm. when we get there in, in early March and they're playing games. Last AAA promotion that we got to talk about is Chase Petty in Cincinnati. And he was sort of kind of the backfield of louder going up. I mean, he, like it took a little bit and, you know, they, they, I guess, spelled louder's absence with a couple indie ball guys. And then all of a sudden Chase Petty is there. This guy threw 127 innings in Chattanooga at a 4.39 ERA, got up for his AAA debut last week, five innings, five hits, two runs. He came three and walk two. Again, if you haven't seen Chase Petty since he went viral during COVID for throwing that bullpen with Jack Leiter in New Jersey, this is a different Chase Petty. This is a ground ball guy, an innings-eating guy, when you might not have been expecting that whatsoever. The fact that he's going to get one more start in when he's already upped 
his innings total from 98 and 22 to 68 and 23 to 132 this year is interesting to me. Yeah. I think they're really encouraged by what they see from Louder up there. Again, I, I mentioned at the end of last week that I think Burns could be one of the first ones to the bigs next year because they're going to try and fill out that rotation. All of a sudden, I think Petty's knocking on the door. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I feel like they're not as high on him as their other arms, obviously. And I don't think yeah. many are. And, and from what it seemed like, what it sounded like is that he was kind of the name that was floated here and there whenever the Reds were were, were in trade conversations. Like it seemed like Petty might have been the, the guy that they were willing to part with, but obviously only if they're getting a good piece because he is a good arm. But, you know, I think the way that he has thrown over the net, the last couple months has really elevated, I think, his status within within the organization. I think with, well, with maybe where he could fit in as soon as, as next year. The, the adjustment to where he went from what you talked about, just the sheer velocity guy, then I think he went too far down the rabbit hole of being that ground ball guy. And now I think he's found this happy medium where he is still using the four seamer at the top. Then he has more of that heavier sinker that he'll get, you know, the ground balls with. But what it's all about with him is this slider that has just become an elite pitch for him. And, and that pitch is just disgusting. Opponents this year against that slider are hitting a buck 80, but it's since really honing in on it further. And it plays kind of like a cutter. It sits 90 miles per hour. He, in the last 10 appearances or the last 10 starts for him, he has held opponents to a 110 batting average with it and a 336 OPS, 36% strikeout rate, and a 21% whiff rate. I mean, just dominating hitters with that slider. So he can come at you with, with a bunch of different pitches. And I really think it's like a cutter that he can manipulate into a, a bigger slider in the in the upper 80s. That cutter version is more like 89, 90. And then he has taste-breaking curveball and a changeup that he mixes in now. So he's really a guy that's going to come at you with a bunch of different pitches. And I think that is a more well-rounded, you know, just true pitcher. And we always thought Chase Betty would be that thrower. And it really seems like he's come along and, and turned into this pitcher where he's got that four seamer at the top. He's got a, more of a traditional two seamer. And then we just talked about the secondary. So I think he's, uh, assuming, as he, assuming he could say healthy. And that was the other big question with some of the arm yeah. history he's had. And he's racked up these innings. I, I think this is a guy that could definitely be that number four type of starter, maybe flash a little bit more than that, but number four type of starter and eat innings. And, you know, that, that is not what I would have ever imagined with him. I still think that there's middle rotation upside when you're looking at a guy that's 21 years old as he maybe learns to just use his entire arsenal and maybe find a better feel for the changeup. But it probably is closer to that number four starter uh, that flashes more than that. And I think you clearly see the fallback of, of a really good reliever with how elite that slider is. And now with the way that the fastball is kind of trended to uh, being able to get at least some whiff at the top because that, that is a fastball that's just been get, getting hit hard at, at every stop, but at least he's been yeah. able to mask it enough now. I also think we're at a certain point just looking at like the Reds in the macro where they lost essentially all trust in, in Graham Ashcraft and uh, Lodolo. Like you have to be at the point where you're starting to lose faith in, in Lodolo. You just have to assume that you have to assume that you're going to have at least two gaps in the season where you're going to have to fill in for him. Exactly. Exactly. And I think this is the perfect guy next year to do that, where majority of his starts could come in AAA and he gets up for his first 10 starts and they may be separated by two months. That's fine. I I have a question for you then on that front. Exactly. Um, tell me which of these pitchers, if any, you would take over Chase Petty for next year. And by the way, mm -hmm. Chase Petty, did, did we go over the numbers in the AAA debut? Did you mention that? Yeah, I did. Yeah, pretty solid. Um, yeah. And what I like is he did it without the strikeouts, right? Like he just was able to, to hold his own there. Right. If he puts together a few more solid AAA starts, another guy that shines out of camp, uh, would you take any of these arms over him going into next year brandon williamson no i i agree with that um julian aguiar maybe i think they're pretty comparable i think petty has better stuff but aguiar has also proven reliability which is you yeah. know decent so i agree with that i would lean petty with the chance of like continuing this hot stretch that we've seen from him yeah. obviously Rhett louder has the edge Yes. Andrew Abbott obviously has the edge. Yes. Graham Ashcraft. No, I I lean petty at this point. Like Ashcraft, I, I think, has given us too much runway to prove that he may not be a guy in that rotation. Very valid. So, and then Jacob Junis. No. 
<laughs> now, next question. Nick please. Martinez is has a 2025 player option. That dude's opting out. That I dude shoves. Be. Yeah. He's shoving. It's crazy. So the rotation next year, you got Hunter Green at the top. You you hope you got Nick Lodolo healthy, but you are we've already said like that's kind of like you're planning on him just being half in, half out. Yeah. You got Rhett Louder. Nick Martinez opts out. Who who's Abbott. got the four or five? Abbott it's has Andrew Abbott at four. And then it's kind of open, right? Where it could be Ashcraft, it could be, but even if it is Ashcraft, even if it is one of the other guys, you still are quite concerned about. I mean, all these guys were very hurt this year. Like it, Ashcraft be, is currently hurt. Abbott is it, currently hurt. So it, Petty's going to see a lot of innings next year in the big league level. I think that's yeah. very clear. I, I think there are three guys there that I, I kind of look at as, hey, we can cycle you to and from AAA at this point. And let me just say, Connor Phillips' last two starts could have him in this conversation again. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden, wow. Um, but I would say the three guys that jump out to me in terms of vying for that five spot would be – um, and, and it sucks because I don't know the intricacies of Williamson's deal. Like he had something called a Bennett lesion, which I don't really understand. Um, so I'm just not going to dive into that. But the three guys that I ID here are Petty, Aguiar, Carson Spires. Those yep. those are the three that jump out to me. And I, I mean, dude, if you cycle two of those guys in Louisville and one of those guys in Cincinnati making starts, fine by me. I want Phillips in the bullpen personally, but yeah. I also understand it. Uh, but just to be clear, like Petty is a level up from the other guys that we've seen rotated in there, like a Lion Richardson or like a Christian Roa or whoever. Like, right. he's he's a guy that really could grab a rotation spot. So they have some depth for next year, uh, which I think is much and very welcomed, considering how rough this year has been. I was fired up for their depth this year, and now I'm like, just wait till next year. Like we're we're playing that game. It's like 2024 was practice. So yeah, damn. Uh, we're gonna get to a couple more promotions and uh, a little double A playoff preview here. But before that, quick break. High A promotion for Aiden Smith, 20 year old, fourth round pick of Seattle. Aiden Smith uh, made his way over to Tampa along with Brody Hopkins in that Randy Arozarena deal. He has played 97 games in low A this year and has an 874 OPS. And I saw you about 10 games in to his uh, tenure with the Charleston River Dogs say that he is probably tracking towards being a top 100 prospect at the end of the season update or the beginning of season update in 2025. Now, all of a sudden, he's going to be a rod for the postseason. And uh, this guy is going to help Tampa try and win a championship, which they try to do at pretty much every level. Fortunately, <laughs> Durham won't be there, but Montgomery is fully, like, I think the favorite to win that damn thing in double A, which we'll get to in a moment. And all of a sudden, like, Bowling Green gets boosted. It, it's fun that Tampa prioritizes winning like this. And I know yeah, that cool. I've said that before, but, like, it is – it's so cool to see being competitive at every rung on the ladder be a priority for them. Because I think that has really helped them win with a low payroll at the big league level. These guys are learning to win, and they give Aiden Smith a chance to learn how to win. It's a lot of value to it. I, I, I really realized how important it was to them when they sent Xavier Isaac down from high A back to low A to go play some playoff games in Charleston. And I was like, that's awesome. Uh, and, and he got to get some extra games in and, and you know play in uh, an intense environment. And, and, yeah, I know it's it's minor league baseball. It's not as, as important, but – it becomes very monotonous and very individual results oriented in the minor leagues. And how couldn't it be? It has nothing to do with the players. Any human being would become individual results oriented. And it's like a couple games out of the year where winning can be the focus where you can actually lock in on, okay, runner on second base. Let me roll over, roll over to second. If I'm a left-handed hitter, like Xavier Isaac, move the runner over to third with, with, with no outs yeah. um, and, and get him into scoring or getting 90 feet away from scoring a run. You're not doing that in the minors because you don't no. get anything for that. It just goes down as a ground out. But in a must-win game or once you get to the show, like those are the things that you want to do. So just being able to play some games where you can kind of lean into that side of things I think is, is, is important. And Aiden Smith, first game, you can also just go yard. And that's exactly what he did in high A uh, in this playoff game for Bowling Green. It's a home run in his first game at that level, uh, which is just, uh, again, I think really fun for him to just be able to get that opportunity. No doubt. Um, I will also say, uh, I think there are some GMs that have no idea if their affiliates are even contending for a postseason berth. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think that we skew too far the other way now. And the fact that Eric Neander does prioritize, like, hey, personnel decisions around postseason pushes at his affiliates is really cool. It is nice when you just go yard in your high A debut, especially yeah. when every run matters like that. Situational baseball is sick, but homers are sick. Yeah. Homers so are I great. Would, I would just try doing that, too. Where do you where do you ballpark him being in a top 100 update? 90s? Yeah, probably. It depends on how many graduates because I, I I love this type of player. It's so easy for me to kind of like slap my name on them and say like, okay, I feel pretty safe here because he's such a good defender. Like I said, I think it's a seven glove and center. And then he hits the ball in the air consistently and makes good swing decisions. He's going to strike out. And I think he's hedged that a lot. And you look at his last 50 games, this isn't including the postseason games. 317, 427, 505 slash five. I mean, that, that that's outraged, and I still think he's tapping into more power. We've, we've seen him flash 112 mile per hour exit velocities, but he's still just learning to get into it because he was 19 years old for most of the season. So, I, I mean, I, I want to see a little bit more of just like the hit tool before I think I can really push him into the top 50 side of things. But this is a guy that I think anywhere from 90 to, to 60, I'd feel very comfortable because I at least know – that even if the hit bat doesn't fully come along, he's going to hit homers, he's going to walk, and he's going to play elite defense in center field. Um, and even if the homers don't fully come, okay, he's going to have enough contact, I think, to survive. He's going to walk, and he's going to play elite defense in center field. So I, I, even the low-end outcomes, I feel really optimistic about. But the thing is, is I think there's some very high-end outcomes here, potentially, as he continues to tap into more power. So um, I'm, I'm excited about him, and I think this was one of the better pickups by any team uh, that was selling or half and half. Uh, yeah. at the any team that was adding prospects, I thought this was in terms of a bang for your buck. I thought Aiden Smith was as, as good of an addition as we saw. A Hopkins guy is pretty good, too. I yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that might be the best trade uh, in terms of just value-wise. Like, I think so. I, we'll have to check with that website, though. Uh, yeah, no doubt. It's uh, been rejected uh, by our model. I think paywall, though, now. So oh, it is pay one now. Thank goodness. If you subscribe, then go ahead and check that. But I, yeah, I unfortunately do not. Dis- I do not uh, subscribe to that. Um, this guy, no doubt, is firmly inside the top 100. He already was. JJ Weatherholt, Homer in his low A postseason debut in Game One at Daytona. Game Two, three for four. They win that series. They go to the <laughs> Florida State League Championship Series. Game one against Lakeland goes three for five. So he now has seven hits in three postseason games right now. Hit machine, you teased it off the top. He doesn't want the season to end, no no doubt about that. Um, What has changed with your perception of J.J. Weatherholt? Because I know that you were incredibly high on him at the draft. I know that you liked watching him his first couple games in low A. And since then... We really haven't done much of a check-in on him. We briefly talked about him in the draft update. Is there anything that is catching you by surprise with him? Or is it really like, oh, he's doing the thing that I thought he was going to do? I would say the latter. I think it's exactly – he's exactly as advertised, which is really refreshing for a guy it's, that we it's had. refreshing. As- and frankly, let me say, that is kind of surprising sometimes because you expect to tick down. And I, I think we are too optimistic sometimes where it's like, oh, they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. And it's like, oh, shit. You actually did it. That's awesome. Yeah. Or, you know, guys, you, yeah, you, you just, you always feel like, oh, well, he's, he's, look at what he was doing in college, like you said. And uh, I'm sure it'll keep going and they disappoint you. Or the other way where I'm like, oh, I'm worried. Okay. Well, Christian Moore, he does what he does. Like, okay. Let's, let's adjust. But when it's right in the middle, sometimes it's like, that's nice. It, it, you, you kind of envision, this is exactly how I kind of envisioned his pro debut to go, where I thought the power will take a little bit of time. It just, it's so natural is when you're a, a hitter, that's very good bat to ball wise, but also has the power. Yeah. It's going to take some time to, to fully lean into that power professionally. And then maybe at the big league level, because it's, it's one thing to just get to the ball as it's starting to move a lot more effectively and, and locate better and just better stuff overall. And then it's another thing to be able to consistently elevate that. I think whether Holt will get there his last seven games, by the way, he has five, three hit ball games in that stretch. So 18 hits in his last seven games, which is just, just, just crazy. But the other part that I love, and this might be the one wrinkle that I think has stood out above all, even though he was really solid against left-handed pitching in college, I would say that would be the thing that has stood out the most to me is that 
he is crushing lefties. Like, like he is all over left-handed pitching over the last handful of games. He's just looked so, so comfortable in that regard. And I think he's five for his last 12. The last ball game, he had three hits all against lefties as well. Just controlling his body so well, staying on everything. He just He's too good for the level. Uh, and, and I get why they just want to keep him there, and he's getting – more games in anyways, naturally. It, it, it's the same for him, I think, low A versus high A to just get these ABs, even though high A has been a lot tougher. He'll get there yeah. next year, and it's not going to really delay anything. But he's just clearly too good for this level. I think that's the one thing that probably stands out above all. He's just more advanced than everybody else there. It's the cardinal way, right? He like keeps somebody there for way too long, and then you bump him. Quinn Matthews was there for way too long, and then you bump him. So. Cardinal way, kind of stinking at the big league level, but uh, it's it's working, I guess, at the minor league level. Uh, speaking of the Cardinal way, the Springfield Cardinals are in the Texas League semifinals, or I guess the division championships. I'm literally going to do a games of the weekend type thing if you listen to the Just Baseball show. Three game series, double A playoffs start tomorrow, Tuesday the 17th. I'm going to have you pick a winner, and okay. I'm going to give you the yeah. notable names on each roster, Okay. Texas League, let's start with the North Division series. This is Springfield against Arkansas. So the Springfield Cardinals, the uh, Cardinals AA affiliate, Arkansas, the Mariners AA affiliate. Notable players in Springfield. Tink Hens, TK Roby, Max Radchich, Leonardo Bernal, Jimmy Crooks, Chase Davis. Arkansas, you've got Logan Evans, Michael Morales, Harry Ford, Cole Young, Ben Williamson. Who you got in that one? Uh, I, I think I got to go with the Springfield group, especially with Chase Davis being added to the fold there and the way he swung it. Um, I mean, Morales has been throwing it really well. Yeah. I think maybe he would get the third game, right, depending on how it's timed up. Probably. But Logan Evans would get game one, I assume. I think so. He threw a few days ago. It, but with Evans, too, I, I'm interested to see how they're going to, like, let him go now or not go with from an innings perspective. They've been ramping him back up some. He threw the 13th. So I think he'd probably throw in game two of that series then. I, I got to go with, with the Springfield group. I just think offensively what they've got going on. And then you also still have some some fun arms in, in the fold there, of course, with Tink Hens too. Uh, that's going to be a fun one though. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll lean towards uh, – towards Springfield with those bats. This is like Coach Saban picking on game day, but it's the double-A playoffs instead. And we're just giving you, hey, prospect names. Let's roll with this. Um, other matchup, Frisco and Midland in the other Texas League division. Frisco, Abimelech Ortiz, Aaron Zavala, Emiliano Teodo, Winston Santos, Mitch Bratt. You would think three games set, it's probably Teodo, Bratt, Santos, something like that. Uh, they are taking on Midland, who's got Henry Bolte, a guy that we have not checked in on much at all, but I'm excited to do a deeper dive in the offseason. Denzel Clark, Brian Buelvas. I think it's Buelvas, right? Buelvas, He's got the yeah. prospect intrigue. Jordan Groshans, I had to throw him in. Uh, oh. And Daniel Susak, Jordan Groshans, uh, a Midland rock hound this year. What a fall from grace for Mr. Groshans. But uh, I don't know, like part of me leans Frisco because of that pitching staff. Yeah, I, and, and also – they got Sebastian Walcott, you know, in the fold there too. Oh, so yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the way he's looked of late too, um, I, I, yeah, I got to lean towards towards that Frisco roster. It, it's just, it's just a better. But what's interesting too, though, is Mason Barnett. He's was he acquired at the deadline? I want to say from from the Royals was it at the deadline or was it before I think it was at the deadline where they were able to get him from the Royals in that Ursic deal it was in the Ursic deal Barnett can throw man and, and that's that's going to be a fun arm in there Jack Perkins has looked really solid this year as well like they, yeah. it's not as much of the prospect intrigue maybe but they have guys that go out there and can just pitch and that's why you know it's not just about prospect rankings when it comes to like winning these these series yeah. so I do think Barnett and and Perkins can go out there and, and give them a, a good chance uh, but yeah, I think between the pitching and the offense on on the other side with Frisco, uh, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with that group. Game one is Winston Santos and Barnett, which will be pretty fun to watch, I'm sure. Also, I didn't see Sebastian Walcott when I was going through the rosters because for some reason on MILB.com he is listed as a designated hitter. 
for Frisco. I have no idea why, but he is under the DH category, which is at the very, very bottom. And I typically ignore those guys because they're minor league DHs. DHs, which, by the way, Walcott in his five double A games thus far 348, 375, 609. That's fine. That's yeah. not bad. A homer yet? Uh, that is just a great a bunch, question. Just a bunch of doubles. Does he just have a bunch of – that would be really lame, wouldn't it? No, he homered Yeah, He homered uh, on Saturday. Good. We love that. All right. Penultimate game of the regular season. Good on Sebastian Walker. Yeah, he only he, he also had a 110-mile-per-hour single. Mm, yeah, that's fine. Rockets. <laughs> that doesn't count for the slug, though, unfortunately. <laughs> no, nope, unfortunately, no. But the ex Wub is going to love that. Yeah, it's absolutely. Absolutely. It depends on the launch, too. Um, okay, let's go to the Southern League here. First matchup is Biloxi and Montgomery. I just want to know the run differential that Montgomery is going to win by. Win by Biloxi has like lost some talent. I'd say that is such a deep system, but they've got some guys on the shelf. Um, the, the two really notable guys on Biloxi right now are, are Brock Wilkin and Eric Brown Jr. Pitching wise, there's something to be desired there. Montgomery though, Dominic Keegan, Xavier Isaac, Trey Morgan, Carson Williams, Braden Taylor, Chandler Simpson. Drew Baker, Matthew Etzel, Willie Vasquez, Yoni El Cure, Trevor Martin, Keyshawn Askew. Oh my God. That is the best roster in minor league baseball. Right it's now. gotta be, right? It's gotta be. Um, it's just so, so loaded in the way that Carson Williams has been swinging it lately. Dominic Keegan hit a home run 113 miles per hour the other day, by the way. Absolute rocket. And then, yeah, with with Correa at the top, rotation wise, like. Yeah, this this should be quick work. I, I think that they, they should take care of business. And by the way, Evan Ryford is back mm -hmm. to throwing well out of the pen. Arizona Fall League favorite of mine a couple years ago. He's striking out 40% of, of batters right now out of the pen. So they've got guys out of the pen too. Um, I, I think this is this is going to be a, one of the most lopsided one uh, of all of them, I think. They will. I knock on wood because we're talking about it like it's a foregone conclusion. And that's why Biloxi is going to win in two games. Yes. Yeah. They take on the winner of Birmingham and Tennessee, starting with Birmingham. Noah Schultz will probably throw four innings again. Yeah. Uh, Peyton Pallette is on that team as well. Andrew Dahlquist is on that team as well. And you got Jacob Gonzalez. Riku Nishida is already up to double A, which he's is fine. he slaps the ball around the ballpark and he flies, man. And then Wilfred Veras is on that team, too. You just dove into that Birmingham roster, I'm sure, because you just did the Sox top prospects. I haven't gotten to listen to that Thursday episode yet, but I will yeah. listen. No, I mean, it's not as talented as, you know, it's been in the past with a couple of those guys getting up to AAA. But you get Noah Schultz on the bump, and with the way we talked about on the episode, the way Peyton Paulette's been throwing, um, and he can go like two innings in relief. You could get six quick zeros there between those two, uh, which which I think is, is definitely uh, – Gives them a chance, but on the offensive side, yeah, Jacob Gonzalez has been pretty disappointing. We talked about that, and then you, you look at the rest of the offense; it it kind of tapers off quite quickly there. So, yeah, uh, they're they're going to need to uh, put together a lot of zeros, I think. And and the staff is 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 all right. Losing Mason Adams as well, like it, it, it thinned out. Tennessee, cool to have uh, Cam Smith there. They will take on Cam Smith. They also take on a Pablo Aliendo, BJ Murray, who's down from AAA. Kind of sucks that he was transferred down. It's not it's not promoted, demoted now. It's transferred, yeah. uh, both up and down. Uh, Hayden McGeary is on this team. Uh, who else? I mean, Christian Franklin's hurt. Cole Rotorer is on this team, but Rotorer was in AAA at a point. It feels like the vibes are off in Tennessee. Just looking at the roster. Yeah, it's. I think a lot of it's from the guys that were there before, right? You you lose Matt Shaw, you lose uh, Kevin Alcantara, you lose a few guys, and and all, all to AAA, of course, and it it thins out quite quickly. So uh, they've got some fun bullpen arms and stuff, so they might be able to piece together some zeros. But yeah, offensively, it's uh, it's a little slim pickings there. Something to be desired. Okay, we go to the Eastern League here. The Yard Goats found their way in. So that is Adel Amador. That is uh, Ryan Ritter. That's Sterling Thompson. That's Benny. No, Benny's hurt. Um, that is, uh, let's see, Warming Bernabel, our guy. Uh, but then looking at the Hill, Sean Sullivan is on this roster. Uh, Chase Dolander is on this roster. Um, who else? Zach Agnos is out of their pen. That's a fascinating Hartford team. And then they are taking on Somerset. Somerset is running out the GOAT, Anthony Siegler, um, but also Spencer Jones, 
They have uh, Elijah Dunham is on this team too. Tyler Hardman is on this team. And then pitching wise, is there anybody that really jumps out? Selvage is hurt. <sighs> Matt Sauer, <laughs> rule five pick. Matt Sauer is on this team. Chase Hampton's hurt. This is tough. I think Bang I side. Down. I think I side goats. Yeah. Well, when you've got so Sean Sullivan, who's sitting eighty-seven, right, uh, and has a one-nine-seven ERA in thirty-two innings at Double A, just no one can hit this guy. He had a two-one-six in eighty-three innings in High A. I mean, he doesn't walk anybody, and just seems to create a co- uncomfortable at bat. Chase Dolander. I mean, don't need to tell you much about him. Obviously, that's going to be advantage Hartford when he's on the bump. Yeah. Uh, the offense, I mean, yeah, you'd like to see. I mean, Amador has been better of late, and I think that's a big part of this thing too. So hopefully Amador can have like a really good postseason here uh, and, and and finish finish really strong to the season. But yeah. overall, I mean, you look at Amador, he's lost 40 games, 855 OPS, hitting 292. So you love to see that. So I think that also really helps the yard goats in this one and fun ballpark there too. Uh, home game should be a good time. Uh, Zach Acosta I came out really, really well. And then is, is tapered off. So like all those other guys that I was kind of thinking, Oh, that could be a fun, like a Ryan Ritter solid, but eh. I think yeah. Sterling Thompson's still solid though. And I think that's one of the guys that's probably flown under the radar. Cause he set the bar so high for himself in previous years. He's yeah. been in a pretty tough environment to hit this year and he's still been quite solid for them overall. So like, yeah. I, I think it's like a one Oh five WRC plus. So it's a, it's a really well-rounded team. Uh, and, and I think they probably have a better shot than this this kind of beat up Somerset team. It's been better seeing like just even a little bit more production from like a Spencer Jones and yeah. you know, Elijah Dunham has just been very consistently solid uh, and Hardman can run into him, but he also strikes out a ton. Like this team, I don't have it like in front of me, but I'd imagine that this this uh, Somerset team strikes out as much as anybody in minor league. The league in K rate, yeah, I too. I wonder yeah. if I can. I could probably find that to be honest with you. I'll- Sneaky thing with with Somerset though, they've got some arms that have been throwing well, even with with the top end guys hurt. Where I mean, Cam Schlitter, uh, Schlit Schlitler, Schlitler. I hope I said that right. They get like twenty something whiffs the other night. He's been really solid since getting up to Double A to mid nineties fastball uh, and, and can get a lot of swing and miss. Ben Shields has been solid for them mm-hmm. as well. Um, and then Zach Messenger also. So not not the biggest of names or like the, the the sexiest of names, but also sneaky innings eaters. I love my my minor league innings eaters. Zach Messenger, 150 innings this year in in Double A Somerset. Hmm. Uh, so guys just out up there getting outs. But yeah, from the offensive perspective, it, it does get a little bit thin. Quite final quickly. final yeah. answer is Schlittler. Schlittler. I think it's Schlittler. Schlittler. I think that's good. Also, they're going to hit 1,300 team strikeouts in terms of double-A. Somerset would be – Somerset is fifth in double-A in, in team Ks. So, wow, I would have thought way more than that. No, Amarillo, Cade Moore, Tulsa, Binghamton, and Chattanooga. They wow. Came more. Good. Yep. good. I, I do know that, that Spencer Jones just struck out more than any Yankees prospect ever this year. I think he just hit that that threshold. Wow. Tough. And he's still the golden boy. <laughs> It's crazy. Uh, okay, last matchup that we have is in the Eastern League. You've got Erie taking on Akron. In terms of Erie's roster, that is uh, – wow, Peyton Graham is in double-A at this point. How you Lee is banged up, so he's not playing. Um, Luis Santana is on this team. Gage Workman is on this team. Uh, boy, this is not a good-looking roster, <laughs> however. Um, Troy Melton is banged up. Tyler Madison's hurt. Yeah, no, they're losing to Akron. Offensively, Akron is going to run out Khalil Watson, CJ Kafis, Dion Frias. Um, they have Alexi Planez, who, who's hanging out in the outfield. Uh, Petey Halpin's hurt, but Joe Lampy is there too. This rotation, though, is probably going to look like Austin Peterson, Parker Messick, Tommy Mace. Might be GGs. Yeah, and Aaron Davenport's been really solid this year too. Um, cool. It's just another arm uh, that – is, is, is an option there too. The bullpen is going to be solid at every single level there. This might be the least intriguing prospect uh, matchup here. I would think but so. But DJ Kafis, he's had a really nice year. Fun to watch him, see what he can do. And, and it's been interesting seeing Khalil Watson. Like, is it, what, what's he going to be? But it's been a little bit better. So you know, we'll, we'll see. But yeah, this is probably the least prospect intrigue of, of any of the uh, any of the matchups. Prospect to wrap, Matt Shaw who's in triple a Iowa. You tweeted out a video of his setup 
and yeah. you made a comment that was something like, every time I check in, he's becoming more and more close. I just had a why question as to I, the setup changing. I don't like, that's the crazy thing is I don't even fully know. Um, you know, like guys, it, it kind of can help them. It's just a cue, right. To, to get into that back hip, to get coiled, whatever it may be. feels like when he starts in that position, it maybe allows him to get to where he wants and stay there. For me, when, when I think about hitting, there's a million different ways to start and, and everything like that. You've, you've heard that a million times, but, um, I think if you just take a swing and then figure out, okay, what are my tendencies? Am I someone that tends to like fly open with my front side? Am I someone that tends to to drift forward? Am I someone that tends to cave with their backside? Like whatever your bad habit is that comes out or the thing that takes you out of what the optimal swing is, then you have to figure out, okay, how can I hedge that? And then what, what are some setup things that can get me doing what I need to do with my body to not do what I don't want to do? So sometimes I think we can get a little bit too far down that rabbit hole. And it seems like that might be what's happening with Shaw, but it's also hard to argue against the results because in his last 50 games between double and triple A, he's hitting 332, 397, 583. That's a 980 OPS. Very difficult to argue against that. His hands work so well that even when he's crowded inside a little bit, he can still pull that thing and, and he's so explosive and he can really turn it around. Uh, but I, I do have some concern as to like when he gets to the big leagues, and again, he's been destroying baseballs. Even the more close he gets, it seems like he just continues to destroy baseballs. But he almost looks like he's facing the catcher at this point. Like yeah. You can fully see the 37 on his back. And I, I do wonder, like, if as you start to get maybe pounded in a little bit more and see more pitches inside, I, you know, how, how does he perform there? Is he able to turn all of those around when it's 95, 96, 97 running in on the hands? Maybe he can, but that's just the one thing to monitor there. Uh, but other than that, I mean, it seems like as he's making these little mechanical adjustments, he seems to be performing quite fine. So it, it, it's hard to really argue against the results, I think, whatsoever. Uh, but I will say he definitely is more effective on the outer half of the zone than the yep. inner half um, if you break it down by that. But still, it's not like he's getting blown up on the inner half, so it works. But he just might be one of those – like crazy hitters that just loves to keep changing and keep tinkering and keep doing things. And what I will say with a guy like him is with the athleticism and the feel for the barrel, he could just be one of those guys that gets away with just always tinkering and always messing around. Uh, but it, it, this is as far as I've seen him go to really messing around uh, with the swing. So it'll, it'll be fun to see how, how it continues to work, but clearly right now it's, it's working. Right. He can do whatever he wants and he might just have the magic touch with, with the bat. Is there a guy that is a good example of that in the big leagues or no? I always think about Cal Ripken in terms of someone who just changed every single time you watch. Like his hands would be in a different spot. His stance would be in a different spot. Like every, like almost every game sometimes he would, he would change stuff. But I think it's so hard in the show now. No, like people just try to find what works and stick with it. Right. Um, like I, I can't really think of a guy that's like consistently, consistently tinkering like, like that. I know there are guys that look different in the minor leagues, but I'm thinking about the stars of Major League Baseball and like everybody just kind of looks the same right now. Yeah, you usually stick with what works. And maybe this is going to be what he sticks with. Uh, yeah. and, and maybe that'll be it. Um, but what I do think is interesting is kind of starting that much more closed off. I, I, I just wonder like how he's going to be able to get swings off and maybe pitches in the bottom of the zone, things like that. And you know, he has struggled a little bit more against the changeups and the sinkers, but then he just has been elevating and pulverizing fastballs. So it's a unique setup and well, it, it could very easily work. I don't, there's not a lot of precedent of being that closed off and making it work. I'm also thinking about like sliders towards your front hip. Like yeah. there's a lot of different ways where I think you can kind of be attacked and, and you know, it might, it might be difficult to combat, but for now, I mean, it, it's, it's, quite difficult to say that he should do anything other than what he's doing <laughs> considering right. how productive he's been so it'll just be fun to watch and see how the mechanics continue to look but man he's he's been awesome ending on a crappy note unfortunately same team brennan davis was carted off last week with a left ankle fracture uh this is like it's hard to put into words what brennan davis's arc has been since 2022 21 in Denver, he was the MVP of the Futures game, and he was a top 10 prospect in baseball going into the 2022 season. In 2022, it was back surgery. He had some sort of weird vascular thing going on in his back, and he had surgery to clear that up. And then, uh, what, went to the fall league, and then back tightness wiped that out. And then 
the following year that core muscle surgery. And then this year it was what it was a, it was a back fracture. It was a fracture in like his yeah. lower back. He works his way back. All of a sudden he's, he's on the field. We were not expecting him to be on the field. Frankly, he comes back. And as soon as that happens, he gets carted off with an ankle ankle fracture sliding into second base. Like, well, he hits a 445 foot Homer yeah. and then rips a double, uh, 111 miles per hour and was trying to pull up into second on that actual single as it gets scored. Um, and, and his foot just got totally stuck under him and, and, yeah. and broke. Um, so that's the worst part too, is like every time he was getting back on the field, he was hitting the ball really hard yeah. and looking yeah. good and looking like Brennan Davis again. And it almost makes it just hurt that much more. So I just feel so bad for him. And, um, you know, he, he should have had an opportunity to get up this year had it not been for the litany of injuries. And we, we really saw this guy performing, like really hitting the ball hard, harder than we've ever seen him hit the ball. Yeah. So, and then you know, we had our conversation with him early in the year and, and that was great. And that episode I was really excited about I, I, that one really like, it, I just like sat in silence for a little bit after I saw it that sucks. one. So I, just, I, I don't even know him. And, and I, I just can't imagine the, 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 the mental anguish there because of how high the highs were, like you said, and, and, you know, I hate to, to, to add this wrinkle to it, but it's an interesting conversation is he's on the 40 man. Yeah. And the, the Cubs are going to add to this team, man. And they got a lot of outfielders and they got guys that they have to add to the 40 man ahead of the rule five. I think Owen Casey's going to be rule five eligible, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I think you're gonna have some other guys too. I mean, they m may end up having to clear a 40 spot. And I mean, all I'll say on this front is, yeah, the injury history is ridiculous. But if I were a rebuilding team, I would claim Brendan Davis still in two seconds. No doubt. As no long doubt. as I have a 40 man spot, I would do it in two seconds. And if I if I didn't, because I had like an iffy prospect, I, I would still defer to the 24 year old. He's gonna be 25. When he's on the field, even with all these injuries, we've seen what he can do. A yeah. foot injury is not gonna make it much different, I don't think. If he survived the back stuff, like I would just corner DH this guy, treat him like freaking Byron Buxton mm -hmm. and and or or a Royce Lewis. And just hope you can squeeze something out of him here because it's not a matter of the talent. Like this guy can run into 30 home runs, even if the hit tool doesn't fully come along. He had an 11 17 OPS against left handed pitching this year. Like there's roles to be filled here. And I don't think there's much more development that really needs to be had. It's just being healthy. Um, so you can put him out in the short end of the platoon, get opportunities there and go. Uh, but, you know, I, I almost, I almost am, am interested to see and I almost hope that they DFA him because then if a team does claim him, um, he's going to get an opportunity, I think, sooner than he ever would with the Cubs and maybe a fresh start. Not that it has anything to do with the Cubs, yeah. but there's been so much negative and so many tough moments for him, I think, over the last couple of years, especially in Iowa. Yeah. I wonder if just getting a fresh start somewhere else and just clearing your head. Like, you know, I, I, I always think about that, like with, with Syracuse, I'm very unfair that I place on Syracuse, but, you know, went through some of the toughest times in my life. My father passing away, like I remember, and I'd walk by certain buildings, like when I found that out or with this or that. And. Yeah. It just, I felt like it was a cloud that always followed me. And then when I left Syracuse, it kind of felt like a fresh start. Like, yeah. I, I almost wonder if, and it's not Syracuse's fault. Like, I almost wonder if for Brennan Davis, like, that may end up opening just new horizons from a mental perspective. Because I'm just worried right. about that's mental. I mean, we'll see if the body holds up. It's, it's just going to be a matter of, you know, how it goes. And maybe a new, new medical staff has a different philosophy on how to approach the whole thing. But, you know, this one was fluky. I don't really know, but I think a change of scenery and just maybe an opportunity where he doesn't have to press and just knows he's going to get a shot in the big leagues. Yeah. I just want to see this guy get a shot in the big leagues. It's basically my long winded thing here. Yeah, I I'm, I'm totally with you. And I, I don't know. I just worry that this would make me really tired. And I think that he would, I think that he is incredibly tired. I, I wouldn't blame him for retiring. I'm not even kidding. I know. I know. Like, and I'm not saying like, he, he, I hope he just keeps it going and, and keeps his head down and go, right. but like, from from the mental perspective, like I wouldn't blame him. That's why I almost hope that like getting an op opportunity, getting picked up by somebody else, and say, hey, we we see you as a potential big league piece for us. Like maybe that gives invigorates him a little bit. But that's my thing. Yeah. So he, I I worry that he's tired, but I would frankly assume that he's tired, and I don't doubt him one bit for being tired. I just hope he still loves the game and like loves baseball. It isn't saying baseball did this to me. It's you know, like, hey, let's go find a fresh start elsewhere. I'm totally with you on that front. But 
I I wouldn't blame him one bit if he was like, I'm out of love with this game, man. Like, I would it, be. It, Look at like Andrew Luck. Time and time again. He just fell out of it, man. He was like, I want to I wanna walk my daughter down the aisle. I want to see her grow up. And I'm like, yeah. dude, I totally get that, Andrew yeah. Luck. And I, I could totally see – you know, Brandon Davis just, just coming mean, so, back so many different times. Like how many times can you just keep doing this just to be disappointed again? Um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that. So, you know, only, only Brandon Davis knows what's going on in, in his head and, and everything. But I, I think these kind of conversations are very important because I think you're going to see a lot of you know baseball fans just always thinking about the baseball side. It's like, Oh, we need a clear 40 spot. Okay. What's DFA Brennan? Like, sure. But sometimes just pause to think about like the, the mental well, side background. of this whole yeah. thing the roller coaster that this guy's been on and, 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 and his life, you know, and, and this is like, this is his life and he's been so close and, and it just, it just seems to keep being just like taken away from him right, right at the goal line. So, um, you know, I, I hope he can get back. I hope he is motivated and, and, and still has that passion left. But again, I wouldn't blame him either after all this physical pain and mental pain. Uh, but I hope, I hope he gets a shot one way or another, either the Cubs, if they keep him on the 40 men, that means that they actually, think he could fill a role next year so yeah. either way i think it's a positive but if they don't then i do think there's going to be a team out there freaking the marlins dude like they need yeah. right-handed hitting outfielders in two seconds i would pick that guy up and see Absolutely. what he can do so Absolutely. um you know i'm hoping he gets a good opportunity this this offseason i wish him a speedy recovery and um you know there's there's probably not a single guy aside of like my personal friends in minor league baseball that i pull for harder than brendan davis given his whole uh history i'm right there with you That'll do it for this episode. We've got Phillies prospects this week, uh, which will be fun. I'm hoping to finish that in the next few days, and then we'll have another episode in between. It'll be a three-episode week here. And, of, of course, if you could share it with your friends, help us grow the show, that would be great. Link in the episode description for discount to game time as well. Uh, we should probably talk about that Kumar Rocker debut uh, next episode. So yeah, we'll okay. break that down. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, just – the Rangers staff, I think Kumar and Jack, Jack looked really good in a piggyback role lighter. That is, uh, you know, off of uh, a Max Scherzer start. So we'll talk about some of those players, maybe check in on some of the the rookies um, that have debuted maybe a little bit more recently, see how things are going there. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have Philly's prospects later. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube if you can. Follow us on Instagram and X slash Twitter. And we look forward to talking prospects with you in the next day or two.